When we measure the temperature of the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, today, it's almost a perfectly uniform 2.7 Kelvin across the whole sky. But did you know that one cause of the fluctuations we do see is down to galaxy clusters, supervoids, and dark energy? When the CMB was released, it would have had a temperature much hotter than we see today. It was emitted as a 3000 Kelvin black body, which corresponds to photons with wavelengths of about 970 nanometers, which is approximately UV light, not microwaves as the name suggests. However, the CMB photons are then redshifted as the very space they travel through expands. This is because they have been traveling through space for an incredibly long time, and they lose energy as space expands and stretches out the photons, leaving us with the much cooler 2.7 Kelvin we measure now, which does indeed correspond to microwave radiation. We say it's redshifted because its wavelength gets longer, and red light has the longest wavelength of any visible color of light. I guess this is a bit of a strange name since these photons aren't actually in the visible range, although they were at one point, but we still use the term redshifted. However, there is a way in which the CMB photons can actually gain energy albeit only pretty small amounts of energy. This is called the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, or ISW effect, and it can both give and drain energy from CMB photons, and is one effect that contributes to the fluctuations we see in the CMB temperature map. There are a couple of different versions of this effect, known as the early time and late time ISW, but here I want to focus on the late time ISW, because I think it's both more interesting and, luckily, easier to understand. This late time ISW effect occurs when the universe is dominated by dark energy, which is a mysterious substance that stretches the universe apart at an accelerating rate. Let's imagine a photon that was released as part of the CMB, happily traveling through the universe. Over time, as the universe expands, the photon loses energy, but there is this other effect too, the late time ISW effect, which comes into play towards the end of the photon's journey. Once dark energy starts to dominate the universe, which starts at about 9 billion years after the Big Bang. So from 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the CMB is released, up to about 9 billion years, this effect doesn't impact the photons much at all. But from 9 billion years to now, this late time ISW effect becomes noticeable. This is where the I, integrated, comes from in ISW. It tells us that this effect accumulates over the photon's journey. At any given moment, the effect can't be seen but integrate over or add up the whole journey and this effect becomes noticeable. Imagine our photon approaching a nice big cluster of galaxies, which could be as large as hundreds or even thousands of galaxies, all gravitationally bound together. We'd call this cluster a gravitational well, since the overall strength of gravity from the cluster as a whole is very strong. As the photon approaches the cluster, it falls into the gravitational well. It actually gains energy, Kind of the same way as a ball rolling down a hill picks up speed. We say that the photon gets blue shifted when it gains energy, which is the opposite of red shifted. A galaxy cluster tends to be pretty big, with a diameter of a few megaparsecs, which is between 10 to the power of 22 and 10 to the power of 23 meters. So it takes our photon a pretty long time to travel through the cluster, even though it's traveling at light speed. During this time, because dark energy is dominating the universe, the cluster actually spreads out as dark energy expands the space between each galaxy. Even though the gravitational pull of the cluster is strong, it's not strong enough to stop dark energy from spreading it out. We say that this makes the gravitational well of the cluster shallower. Since gravity gets weaker over distances, the spreading out of the cluster means the overall gravitational pull of the cluster that our photon feels gets weaker. This means that when the photon comes to leave the cluster, it takes less energy to climb out of the gravitational well of the cluster than the photon gained when it entered the well. Just like a ball rolling down a steep hill gains a lot of speed, and it would lose less speed if it rolled up a shallower hill on the other side. The same happens here for our photon. Overall, it gains more energy than it loses. So there is a net blue shift of the photon. Without dark energy, the cluster wouldn't expand enough for this effect to be important. The well would effectively be the same height on either side, and the photon would gain and lose equal amounts of energy in this process. So the late time ISW only makes a difference once dark energy dominates. However, the exact same effect can actually cause a CMB photon to lose energy too. Instead of a galaxy cluster, imagine the photon approaching a huge expanse of completely empty space, what we call a void. Since a void, by definition, is emptier than the surrounding space, 
the photon has to fight against a gravitational pull to enter the void. Whatever matter is behind the photon pulls the photon back with a gravitational tug, and the photon actually loses energy when it enters the void. It's like us climbing a steep hill. It takes energy to do it. As the photon crosses the void, dark energy again does its thing, diluting space and making the hill the photon has to climb down to exit the void shallower. So the photon doesn't gain as much energy upon exit as it lost when it entered the void. Overall, a net loss for the photon, and it ends up with an extra bit of redshifting along with the usual one from the expanding universe. Incidentally, the usual redshift of the photon from an expanding universe can happen anytime the universe is expanding, which it always has been. So this usual effect has occurred ever since the CMB was released, but the late time ISW only happens once dark energy dominates. So it's only relevant for the final part of the photon's journey. Amazingly, we can actually map both voids and galaxy clusters to fluctuations on the CMB temperature map and see the ISW effect in action. For some of the hotter points on the CMB, we can find clusters in that part of the sky that could have caused the blue shifting of the CMB photons to give them a higher temperature. It's also possible to find voids in the direction of some of the cold spots, whose ISW effect would have given the photons an extra redshift and cooled them down. Now, this was all the late time ISW that we've talked about here, but there is actually an early time ISW too, which occurs immediately after the CMB is released. The idea is the same, but the changes in the gravitational wells are caused by the photons themselves, suddenly streaming through the universe. This effect is usually just taken to be a feature of the CMB, since the fluctuations that cause it are undetectable. And this is why I think it's less interesting than the late time ISW. Also, there is no middle time ISW because when matter dominates the evolution of the universe, as it does between the CMBs released and dark energy taking over, the gravitational wells don't evolve anywhere near enough to produce a measurable or important change in the energy of photons. I hope that's given you some insight into what the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect is and the pretty cool way that it affects the CMB photons. Please consider subscribing if you're new, but either way, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.